to our viewers here in Denmark and in, in Europe, and especially good morning to you, Susanna Super from America. Thank you so very, very much for taking your time and being with us this morning. It's my great pleasure, Runa. I'm so happy that we're, we're able to have this conversation today. You know, your book has been a wonderful inspiration to us. It's been very, very important, not just the concept of surveillance capitalism or the other concept of instrumentarian power. They, they've been tools in themselves, but just the, the broad view, the sense of recent history and something that we witnessed, but we never really understood. You put that into a perspective that I felt made us more critical and more able to criticize a new kind of dominant power that we were not aware of. So thank you very much for that. And I can assure you have a lot of readers here. You've become a reference point here, which is rare for a book that is so, so long, but it's because it's so extremely urgent. And, and I want to say immediately that this is the, the book with all my, with all my notes in, in it. And uh, we sell it today with a 20% discount for our viewers. And there will be instructions in the chat box uh, in the bottom of the screen for the viewers. So you find out how to buy it with this very attractive 20% discount. Uh, first, I want to ask you, Susanna, it's obvious when you see America from Denmark that it's been an emotionally very intense experience for all of you to have Donald Trump as your president. And it seems that it has infected people's lives to another extent that we usually see. How has you personally experienced the Donald Trump presidency? Well, this is such a complex question, Rina. Yeah, I mean, other than not being able to sleep at night or you know, waking up with anxiety. Uh, look, the night that we had that upset victory of Mr. Trump, I, I, I said to my children, we were all shell shocked, of course, and my, my children are, are grown, they're, they're in their mid twenties and they're very political and, and intelligent, uh, wonderful people, uh, but we were all shell shocked. And I said to them that night, this election is what it will have taken to mobilize Americans out of their complacency toward democracy, toward real engagement and real action. And, you know, I said that in the wee hours of the morning, I think it was two in the morning or something, you know, we were all on a conference call together. But I, I meant it and I think that, you know, I've, I've clung to that um, view. And I think over these past four years, it has come to be proven so. Mm -hmm. um, when we see uh, the uh, tens of millions of people pouring out to vote early, and, and they're doing it in cities and states where there have been active voter suppression measures, and citizens are determined to make sure that their vote counts in the face of this, uh, of this growing voter suppression, political violence, the suppression of free speech, um, and the whole range of, uh, of new phenomena that we associate with autocracy. Uh, you may have seen, Runa, that um, just a couple of weeks ago, the, the VDEM Institute in Sweden, Varieties of Democracy Institute, issued a comprehensive report on the rise of autocracy around the world. And for the first time now, we have a majority of countries mm -hmm. under autocratic rule. And for many people, certainly speaking for myself uh, and many Americans, but I think for many of us around the world uh, who, who have revered America and the idea of America and America as a beacon of democracy, uh, we see in this report that America is now considered an autocratizing society. And part of this, what they call the third wave of uh, autocratization. So, uh, so uh, this is very uh, somber. This has tremendous gravity to it. But at the same time, Runa, the report is, is quite wonderful because unlike so many reports which take you know, a linear position, 
uh, drawing a straight line out of current data. This report is um, brilliant because they're also looking at the simultaneous rise of resistance mm. of warriors for democracy, ordinary citizens mobilized to fight for democracy within their societies, including American society. And so we also see that the resistance is on the rise in every single one of these countries, including the United States. And so I'm coming full circle to my, my prophecy four years ago that while it has been a very dark time to see uh, Trump follow a 1930s playbook uh, taken right out of, um, right out of uh, you know, the Weimar experience of slowly uh, methodically breaking down uh, policies and practices, ultimately the dismantling of the civil service, you know, right down to the, to the post office, which was of course in the thirties, uh, what Facebook is, is for us today. Uh, but despite this, um, we have two things going for us. One is the general ineptitude of the Trump administration, because yeah. they do not have a real political vision as the fascists of the 30s did. Uh, they don't have real political goals other than to simply advance Donald Trump's ego needs because he is actually, you know, a, a very broken psyche. And I, and I think people all realize that, or many people do anyway. <laughs> um, but, um, but in addition to that, we see that Americans have come together uh, to fight for our ideals, to declare that liberal democracy in the United States of America is not dead and will not die. And we will do, uh, we will fight peacefully through civil and legal means uh, to make sure that, that that is the case. So it's always a dialectic, Runa. And it's the dialectic that gives me great hope uh, for my fellow citizens. I feel very proud of my country right now, even in, in the depths of this, uh, of this um, terrifying experience. Oh, that, I think that is a wonderful an answer because we were just discussing earlier that over the last four years, the first part of the Trump presidency, we thought that America just exported darkness now and fighting instead of negotiation and uh, world picture of winners and losers instead of comrades and people talking together. But actually, if you look at Denmark, the last year, the strongest feminist movement, the Me Too movement, it came from America almost as a direct response to grab them by the pussy by Donald Trump. The strongest anti-racist movement, Black Lives Matter, came from America. Very strong green movement that came from Sweden primarily, but also the Sunrise movement has been important to, to us here and, and you know, even actually, even a socialist movement that, that I know Bernie was there before, but it became stronger and you know, people like uh, AOC, they're heroes here as well. So we have, this has always been Denmark's relation with America. We have your power culture, but we also have the counterculture, which is very inspiring. And you gave us that over these last four years. And actually I see your book as part of that that this is also an American export of a uh, critique of, of American power. I think there's a temptation to that because I do also see it in that in that vein uh, as a response to power. And, you know, the key thing for me, for um, my wonderful friends in Denmark, I, I love your country so much. I have so many good friends there. And, and when I came there last fall, it, it was such a, a beautiful, wonderful experience. Um, but I, I want our listeners to know that uh, the, the way to predict the future is never to draw a line from the present. Mm. That's just not how history works. It's our response. It's our creative response. Uh, what we demand, what we promise to ourselves and to each other. This is what creates the future, that interplay between uh, power and our response to power. So ultimately, as a citizens of a democratic society, we have the responsibility here. 
and that certainly was the was the message of of my work and and remains so every day every day it, there's a temptation now which is perfectly understandable to to look back with nostalgia at the obama era and look back at uh, at the obama presidency as the the era of well-functioning democracy and decency and and liberal consensus uh, supporting basic principles but there's a very radical critique of the obama era in your book and i think it's very relevant how, how, do, how do you look back on on the obama era especially of course as regards to uh, surveillance capitalism well um you know uh the obama had a very close relationship with Eric Schmidt going back to the, the first uh, 2008 campaign. And it was Mr. Schmidt who brought the, uh, the dark arts, shall we say, of psychological and behavioral micro-targeting uh, into the political arena with the Obama uh, 2008 campaign. Now, it's always important you know, um, to put these kinds of developments in their historical context. And, and so I, I want to also emphasize that, you know, at the time when Obama was able to reach out to people in their homes, um, you know, through their desktops or their laptops, in their communities and create community groups you know, by organizing through the digital medium and having some of these targeting capabilities, which were far less sophisticated than they are now, by the way. Uh, you know, many of us, myself included, Runa, we saw this as a positive development mm. because it was a way to reach beyond and outside of the party apparatus. The Democratic Party apparatus was, was you know, wholly trained on, on um, on Hillary Clinton's uh, nomination. And um, this was a way to reach directly to individual citizens and to help them mobilize, to help them connect to the Obama campaign and to help them connect to one another in their communities. So many of us saw this as a, as a really you know, fantastic <laughs> development. Yeah. And um, you know, this, this, this was a period before um, we understood about psychological micro-targeting and how it could be used to manipulate, to suppress the vote, and all of the, you know, the really malicious political aims to which these same methodologies have been put to use in the years since. We started learning about that in 2018, 10 years later, when we learned about Cambridge Analytica. You know, we started to it started to dribble out, of course, after Trump's election in 2016. But it was really when we got the whistleblowers and Chris Wiley and so forth telling us the inside story, you know, that the that the the puzzle pieces really began to come together. Now, of course, we understand that the 2016 Trump campaign used the uh, dark arts of uh, psychological micro-targeting specifically aimed at black voters in the United States of America in swing states to suppress the black vote and apparently with significant success. So we know now the, that these dangers have corrupted our, not only our political discourse, but the actuality of our politics. But so, all of this has to be put in political perspective. The Obama, early Obama campaign opened the door. It brought these methods into the political domain, but they had a different meaning at that time. And of course, once the, I'm not sure what the favorite Danish saying for this might be, but you know, once the horse is out of the barn, yeah. once the toothpaste is out of the tube, <laughs> yes. you know, uh, we increasingly learn that it only takes, uh, you know, somebody who's willing to spend enough money, or uh, a foreign power who has the uh, who has the cyber tools, um, 
you know, just about any malicious actor now can move into these spaces because the raw material that they're using for micro-targeting and so forth is all made available by Facebook. It's all made available by Google. It's made available by these surveillance capitalist operations, which gets us to the other side of your question. <laughs> Not only did Obama introduce the, the political methodologies of targeting, but um, Obama became president at a time when the public sphere's commitment to the surveillance society, you know, was still um, at, a, at a very high level. Osama bin Laden was still roaming the <laughs> earth. And uh, this was still at the very top of America's domestic and foreign policy, the war on terror. So the war on terror starting in, in 2001 with the 9-11 uh, attacks, the war on terror really was the legitimation context in which surveillance capitalism was allowed to grow and flourish. Before uh, September uh, uh, 2001, before the, the day of the attacks on, um, on September 11th, um, and even literally the day before, the conversation in the American Congress was a conversation about the need for federal privacy legislation. Hmm. Because there was a growing realization and indeed a growing consensus that the fledgling internet companies were already using methods of monitoring and tracking like cookies and web bugs things that we consider in the larger scheme of things pretty benign today. But nonetheless, um, the Federal Trade Commission and other bodies within the US government um, had come to the conclusion that these little companies were not going to be able to self-regulate and that they were already um, uh, aud audacious in their invasion of user privacy. So the whole conversation was about how do we stand up the laws that are going to stop this kind of uh, practice? And on 9-11, everything changed. And now it was all about total information awareness. And of course, the public intelligence agencies, they wanted, they were, they were patriots. And they were uh, feeling humiliated and ashamed that they had not, quote, connected the dots. But if you're going to connect the dots, there's a problem because you can't connect the dots until you have the dots. And so how are we going to get the dots? This became the issue. And of course, even the NSA and the CIA, these entities live under democracy and they live under the American Constitution. And they were not empowered to collect all the dots. So now these little internet companies became the heroes. <laughs> Because in them, they saw the, the intelligence community saw in these little companies the capabilities for a kind of surveillance that would indeed be able to collect all the dots. Because the, the premise of connecting the dots is also the premise that you have to have all the dots. So now we're all dots. Everything becomes a dot. And that's where we entered the danger zone. And that gave these companies permission to grow their surveillance capabilities rather than have law to constrain or, or criminalize them. And of course, Obama came uh, uh, seven, eight years later, uh, and this was still the dominant paradigm. And uh, the war on terror was still a, a central issue of policy and therefore Obama continued to support and uh, provide legitimation and permission for, for surveillance capitalism to grow and flourish, which culminated by, by, by 2013, even before Edward Snowden entered history, we had leaders of the CIA stating publicly that it was the internet companies uh, that had been used by the intelligence community to quote, weaponize and militarize the internet. 
And so even before Edward Snowden, there was an understanding in these communities that thanks to these internet companies, which had now grown into massive corporations and were soon to be bona fide surveillance empires, that thanks to these corporations, um, the entire internet had become owned and operated by surveillance capitalism. And certainly um, President Obama and his administration played an important role in continuing this uh, legitimation and, and actually um, amplifying it. Sure. I have to say in President Obama's defense, one last word, sure. which is uh, it made me very proud you know, President Obama is famous for his end of the year uh, choices. He picks 10 books that yeah. he considers the most important books of the year. And at the end of 2019, he did pick The Age of Surveillance Capitalism uh, as his uh, most important book of the year. I, have, I haven't had a chance to discuss that with him. I don't know if that represents a rethinking of these policies or uh, a remorse or, or the fact that, you know, he, perhaps he learned something with this book uh, that, that he really appreciated. As, um, you know, we say uh, hindsight is 2020, and we, we say it disparagingly, but actually, hindsight being 2020 is a good thing because that means that we have an opportunity to reflect on the past and learn from it with new clarity. Uh, so I believe in that. And perhaps uh, President Obama has had the opportunity to indulge in some of that as well. And in all fairness to Obama, I think when Bernie Sanders left the race and Joe Biden was nominated, Joe B Obama came out and said that he, that he would have been more radical today than he was 12 years ago, that it was, it was another social and economic situation in America. And I felt that was kind of apologizing for all the things that he didn't do. Um, I don't know if that was meant sp specific uh, with address to surveillance cabinets, but he did say that, that he could have been more, more, more radical. It is often we have the sensation that this industry of surveillance capitalism is just too powerful for democracy. I know you end your book on a hopeful note and referring to what happened with the, the New Deal in the 30s in, in America, but looking at the complex, it seems like there's a concentration of power that's everywhere in our production system and our educational system. And it's very, very hard to confront. So I was very delighted when I heard Elizabeth Warren's plan to take on big tech. And then when she lost, I, I thought, well, maybe we won't see the big political battle, but now we have this lawsuit filed by the Donald Trump admini administration against, against Google for choking competition. And it's been, this, this lawsuit has been called the biggest antitrust lawsuit for two decades since the Microsoft lawsuit in 1998. And I've seen some surprising enthusiasm from people who are usually very pessimistic. How do you see the perspectives of this lawsuit? Well, look, we have just gone through the first two decades of the digital century with surveillance capitalism growing and flourishing at an, an, an incredible rate uh, in, only, in only two decades. I mean, uh, for, and less so for Facebook. Facebook went public in 2012. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, we're, we're looking at an extraordinary acceleration of growth so that these companies, and, I, and when I say these companies, I mean Google and Facebook, of course, the pioneering surveillance capitalists and the, and the surveillance um, capitalism, pure plays, if you will, um, but also Amazon and Microsoft and Apple uh, really now dependent upon surveillance capitalism in their own practices and in their larger ecosystems. So, um, and, then of, and then of course, this has become the, the default uh, model, economic model for the entire tech sector and increasingly across the normal economy. So uh, they want us to believe a couple of things. One, they want us to believe that these practices are the inevitable consequence of digital technology, which we know they're not. We can easily imagine digital technology without surveillance capitalism. We, it's impossible to do the reverse, to imagine surveillance capitalism without digital technology. 
it has to, it relies on the digital and has hijacked the digital for the narrow purposes of this economic logic. Okay, so it's had a 20 year run. And for the reasons we've just discussed, it has been unimpeded by law. Now, we're not in that different a position moving into the third decade of our century than we saw in the 20th century, at least speaking for the American case, if you will permit me. Sure. Uh, you know, 1929, 1930, we saw the, the Great Depression and we entered that, that fourth decade of the 20th century without the institutions, the charters of rights and the legislative frameworks that were needed to finally take on uh, the overweening power of the huge industrial capitalist enterprises. We had had antitrust for a while since, uh, since 1890, the Sherman Act, but, um, but even what antitrust was able to do was not enough to really curb the power of these massive companies. We needed workers' rights and we needed consumers' rights and we needed legislative frameworks uh, around those rights and legislative frame frameworks that oversaw all kinds of things from um, consumer safety to, to worker safety. And um, we needed new institutions that would regulate markets and trade and banks and financial markets and uh, making sure that uh, food was safe and that uh, medicine was safe and that um, you know workers could uh, strike and and um, join unions and bargain collectively and all all of these kinds of things so so much of this massive inventiveness and creativity institutional creativity came to bear in the fourth decade and carried us through the rest of the 20th century. I believe we're in a similar situation now, Runa. Um, if we were looking back on these last two decades and we were seeing law after law and effort after effort thrown at the problem of surveillance capitalism without effect, then I think we would have some reason to be pessimistic. The fact is we have not begun a, 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 a methodical and comprehensive contest with this economic logic that, um, that uh, um, removes its validity, that contests its legitimacy and that criminalizes some of its core practices like taking people's experience without their knowledge and translating it into data, which is then claimed as proprietary for downstream processes of uh, analysis and sales. Um, these things are fundamentally illegitimate. In any other context, they would be called stealing. And so, uh, you know, I, I think, so to get back to your question, antitrust, is antitrust going to be the answer? Well, look, in, a, in America, we have this old joke. Um, it, it, it says, um, it asks the question, why is the drunk looking for his keys under the lamppost? <laughs> yes. And the answer, you know the answer. The <laughs> answer is because that's where the light is. Okay, so why do we begin with antitrust? We begin with antitrust because that's where the law is. We have laws to address the antitrust, anti-competitive harms that are uh, part and parcel of these companies' operations. Let's remember that these companies are ruthless capitalists as well as being ruthless surveillance capitalists. Now, so there is relevance to antitrust. And in my view, the most important aspect of this relevance is that uh, it is a, it's a huge public announcement. It's a huge megaphone on which democracy announces that we are back in the game. Democracy yeah. is back in the game. Lawmakers and citizens are back in the game. 
we are no longer going to accept your practices and as inevitable. You know, even what they do um, anti-competitively, they blame it on what they call uh, network effects, <laughs> you know, which is another way of saying this is in the inevitable consequence of technology. And now democracy is saying, we, we do not accept that. So this is like how we begin to turn the ship you know, how we begin to turn the Titanic, if you will, Runa. <laughs> but it's only the beginning. If it's only the beginning, and if our lawmakers understand that it's only in the, the beginning, then it becomes a positive development. Because when we talk about disinformation and misinformation, which is on the, you know, the key issue on people's minds in America and all over the world right now, when we talk about uh, the illegitimate monitoring and tracking of our lives to translate our lives into behavioral data, as I said a moment ago, for their onward processes of, of analysis and sales, these are illegitimate actions uh, that uh, repurpose our private experience as their free raw material. This is fundamentally illegitimate. This is a fundamental act of theft on which the entire edifice of surveillance capitalism is built. And again, people all over the world, including in America, uh, are, are in huge majorities. I'm talking about in the 70s and 80 percentiles, and even in the 90 percentiles are fundamentally set against this. So, we have an opportunity to make our announcement. Democracy has awoken. The sleeping giant is back on the move. We're going to address the harms that are the low hanging fruit, if you will, but we're also going to move quickly to address the unprecedented atrocities of surveillance capitalism and the way in which this economic logic necessarily puts us on a collision course with democracy, the way it fouls and corrupts social discourse because of its algorithms that are geared toward the maximization of engagement, the way it undermines human autonomy with psychological manipulation through uh, micro-targeting, subliminal cues, engineered social comparison dynamics, real-time rewards and punishments, and the use of gamification, all of it subliminally, all of it outside user awareness, uh, and the way in which it fundamentally sets itself against democracy by creating these massive new inequalities represented by these huge concentrations of knowledge and the power that accrues to such knowledge. And, and these concentrations are represented in the growing abyss between what we can know and what can be known about us and the, uh, the consequential uh, congruent abyss that is also growing rapidly between what we can do and what can be done to us and what can be done to us without our awareness and therefore without our right to contest. So these are profound new inequalities which are profoundly anti-democratic. And so both from the, from the grassroots at the level of the individual, uh, individual democratic citizen and from the, the superstructure, uh, as we look at these huge new inequities in our societies, these are profoundly anti-democratic operations that must be interrupted and outlawed and criminalized in my view. It seems to me that over the last just maybe five or 10 years that public opinion about the tech, tech giants have shifted as well. I remember just a few years ago, we were seeing movies about Mark Zuckerberg where he was portrayed as a hero and an artist and, and movies about Steve Jobs where we were like idolizing them as entrepreneurs shaping the future, not entirely good people, but they were great creators like taken out of an Ayn Rand novel and we were idolizing them and, and they, and it seems that public opinion has now shifted totally in a very short span of time that there is kind of a, what you call an, an, an awakening. And it seems to me also that actually one of the few 
issues where you can reach some sort of agreement between Republicans and Democrats is a kind of principled opposition to the, the power of, of tech giants. At first, I was, a little, I, I, I was a little disappointed that Joe Biden would be the nominee uh, because I was hoping for Elizabeth Warren. But then I realized he'd been quite critical of, the, of uh, surveillance capitalism, also because of his personal experience with, uh, with Facebook and Google. How do you see the potential for Joe Biden as someone making new alliances, someone with a new public opinion? How, how do you trust him to take on big tech now? if he wins the election? Well, um, you know, um, first of all, I think that um, Vice President Biden, um, I believe that he recognizes and his team recognizes that, you know, they've all been thrust into an extraordinary moment in American history hmm. where we are facing threats that most of us never imagined possible in our country. We've talked about the threat from autocracy and we've been talking about the threat from this um, massive uh, anti-democratic uh, uh, economic juggernaut of surveillance capitalism. And of course, the final, um, the final uh, ribbon that ties it all together here is that these threats cannot be separated. That it's the unbridled uh, amplification of surveillance capitalism uh, that has supported and also legitimated the rise of autocracy and autocrats around the world, including in my country. Uh, and even today, Donald Trump and his um, and his uh, people are uh, posting misinformation and disinformation at a rapid rate, even though Facebook had, had made a commitment uh, to eliminate this kind of content in the days leading up to and subsequent to the election. So, um, so we've come to this juncture where technology and democracy are now inseparable issues. We can't address one without addressing both. I am very hopeful that the Biden team and Vice President Biden uh, understand this and that they will bring people into the conversation, bring people into the policymaking framework uh, who are ready to work on these issues and take us, you know, not just through another exercise, a decade long exercise in lawsuits against these companies as we went through with Microsoft, uh, because we, we, we literally cannot afford another decade where we do not address these critical mechanisms and methods of surveillance capitalism. If we spend another decade having our experience turned uh, weaponized against us as behavioral data for this kind of targeting, not only from uh, commercial entities, but from political entities. Uh, if we spend another decade at the hands of these algorithms with misinformation and disinformation dominating our social discourse, I mean, there will be no hope for democracy, whatever President Biden chooses to, to do were he to be elected tomorrow, as I hope he will be. Um, so, uh, so we need action. This is the third decade. This is the correct time. It's not too late, but we have no time to spare. And um, I am very hopeful that, um, that this team is going to recognize we are at a crossroads in history. It's now or never. We have no time to waste. And we're going to figure out what to do about it. That's my belief. That's I'm glad to hear that. I have just one last question for you because we have only five five minutes left, and there are so many questions that I would have loved to ask you. But it's it's a very important point in your book that we cannot understand new way new systems of power through the old metaphors. It's a very important point that we should not use the ana analogy to Big Brother of of George Orwell. That we should instead understand what what you call instrumentarian power is. And I've tried to explain this to my kids, that this is that they should understand instrumentarian power, how that operates and how they 
participate in that. But that's a, that's a complex understanding of, of power. And my last question for you is, how would you explain instrumentarian power to people that are, to youngsters that are 15 years old? Okay, well, um, here's, here's one opportunity that we all have right now. You know, it, I think it's maybe three or about three weeks ago now, Runa, yeah. that um, channel, the Channel 4 investigative news team in the UK, um, maybe, you, maybe you saw the broadcast, but they did a, two, two, a series over two nights. Um, I, I think it was three weeks ago. I was, I was uh, oh, yes, yes. interviewed on the, on the second night, but they drilled down into the Trump administration's use of Facebook data to suppress uh, the black vote. Uh, they were looking specifically in Milwaukee and Wisconsin, which was an important swing state uh, that year as it is this year. Uh, but they were also you know, referencing, referencing the wider phenomenon. Sit down with your children and watch those two nights of their reporting, because this is a story about instrumentarian power. No jackbooted soldiers came to the homes of those black citizens and said, we're about to drag you to the gulag or the camp at gunpoint. No one threatened those black citizens with violence or murder as Stalin or Hitler would have done. That's how voter suppression was done uh, under totalitarianism. People were massacred, right? And that's how they controlled the population. The Trump administration did nothing like that. What they did was legal. They were the biggest ad spenders, political ad spenders in the Facebook system. They got tremendous depths of data about black voters. They were able to use those data to uh, carve out a segment of people who could be dissuaded from voting, right? You're supposed to use the data <laughs> in order to get people to go vote for your candidate, but that's not what they did. They used the data to get people not to vote at all, not to participate in, de in, de in their democracy with the greatest, most fundamental right we have, which is the right to vote. And so using those um, data, they were able to figure out people's psychology, their personality, their behavioral patterns, and use that to target messages to them that manipulated their psyches and persuaded them not to go vote. If you're somebody, somebody, for example, who really follows what other people do, they told you, they got you to, to not vote because they were telling you, none of your friends are voting. You know, all the, all the smart black citizens uh, think that it's, it's really bad idea to go vote. The way we're gonna protest is we're gonna withhold our vote. You know, if you're somebody who um, is afraid of certain things, they said, if you go to the voting polls, these things that you're afraid of are gonna happen. So, you know, don't go and vote. So they could use your demons to get you to not vote and it worked. Nobody, nobody got hurt. Nobody was sent to prison. This is instrumentarian power. Instrumentarian power works its will it works its objectives, whether they are commercial objectives, societal or political objectives through the medium of digital instrumentation. Remember we talked about weaponizing and militarizing the internet. This is how it works because the companies now, the private companies have, have made so much in, information about us transparent. They've turned us all into dots and anyone now with the right amount of money or the right skills can come along and connect the dots to manipulate us toward their own ends. This is instrumentarian power. And if we're looking out there for Big Brother, if we're looking out there for the jackbooted soldiers, we're missing entirely the power that is already saturating our lives, disfiguring our democracies, and it, because it's a new kind of power, it requires a new kind of contest. 
a new kind of resistance. That's where we have to invent the new charters of rights, the new legislative frameworks, the new institutional forms that are going to be right for our time, 20th century threat, 21st century threats require 21st century inventions to contest those threats, which is why I argued a moment ago, antitrust is fine if it's the beginning and not the end. If it's what we build on for a true 21st century response that will finally make our digital century safe for, compatible with democracy. It will make the 21st century a century where we advance the aspirations of a democratic people. This is the work that we have not yet undertaken. And the third decade is our time for this important work. Well, thank you so very much. I think no one has given us better metaphors and tools to understanding it than, than you have. And now today, you've even given us a little hope and optimism and a sense of that we might be part of achieving something great for the third decade of the 21st century. Thank you so very much, Susanna, for taking your time and talking to us. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rune. Thank you so much. And thank you, all my friends in Denmark. I hope to see you in person again very, very soon. And we wish you a good election day tomorrow. Bye-bye. Fingers crossed. <laughs>